But we do sometimes get discouraged, don't we? Things don't always go our way. In life, it's true. Health sometimes fails. Problems come up. Things break down, and so bills begin to pile up. Health doesn't always go the way we want it to go. Sometimes our health fails, and we're not... We don't feel as well, and we visit the doctors, visit them quite often. We seemingly keep the the uh, economy going by visiting the doctor. We get discouraged in life. We get discouraged in work. Those that are still working, you know, things don't always go your way. The doctor, or excuse me, the the <laughs> the, the employer, the manager doesn't say and do the things that you want done the way you want it done and that's true in life and life we just get discouraged life we get down life does not always hand us a bowl of cherries sometimes we get the pits you know sort of like the old saying goes sometimes we're the windshield and sometimes we're the bug well that's just life and we don't like that and you know we might say well Is there a way to get around that? Well, I don't know that there is. When I look at the Bible, I see folks such as Elijah and others that got discouraged. But I do see in the Bible, (laughs) excuse me, some help, some help for us. That when we get discouraged, when we get down, that there's, there's help for us. In Psalm 42, David makes the claim. He says, Matter of fact, not once, not twice, but three times in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are really parallel. And many have said that that actually, and there are there is some some, I guess you could say, evidence to this fact that at one time this was all one psalm, and that we have through the years divided it. David makes the statement. He says. Why are you cast out on my soul, and why are you disquieted in me? Hope in God, and I will yet praise him, the help, my countenance, and my God. Why do we get down? Well, we get down for a lot of reasons, and we've already we've already stated those. But how do we get up from them? It's not that we get down, it's how you get up. It's sort of like getting in the floor. It's not getting down there sometimes is the problem, it's the getting up. He changed your old, well, about Thursday you'll be able to walk. <laughs> I, t- I told Suzanne this morning, I said, you know, I am so glad that I do my yard work on Friday because by Sunday I almost feel like preaching. <laughs> and it's, it, yeah, I understand. And so, you know, how do you get back up? How do you, how do you, you overcome the discouragement that, that happens? You know, you, you sometimes you, you look at the attendance board and you say, man, you know, things aren't going the way we want it to go. And you look at the, the contribution, and sometimes, oh, man, things aren't going the way you want to go. And then sometimes the preacher gets up, man, that's, you know, that's not the way we wanted it to go. And so you, you have to ask yourself, well, David gives us, I think, four points in this. He says, first of all, put your trust in God. Isn't that what he said? He asked the question, why am I so upset? Why am I discouraged? Why am I disquieted? And he says, he says, hope in God. It makes sense, doesn't it? Sometimes, though, and especially when we're discouraged, we feel as if God has forsaken us. We feel as if God has left us. We feel as if God really is sitting out somewhere watching but not participating. And when we feel that God is watching and not participating, we think that God has all of a sudden, he has abdicated his throne, he has left us, he cares nothing about us, he cares nothing about what's going on with us, or nothing about our life, and thus, consequently, we see him as a far off. And many individuals, as I have ministered for 40 years, many individuals then begin to walk off. They walk away. They see God, but they see him far off. And a lot of times they get discouraged, and that discouragement bubbles over, and consequently where they begin to look is not in God. 
but in themselves. I can tell you quite a few stories of individuals that I've talked to through the years, and you probably could too, you could as well, that grew discouraged. You know, they didn't like the way things were going. So what did they do? They walked away to their own thinking, their own philosophies, their own devices, instead of turning to the one, as the psalmist said in Psalm 145, verse 7, great is the power of God. Mighty God. Great is the power of God. We need to remember that. God has not left. God has not walked away. God has not forsaken us. God has has not just left us out to dry. God is still there. God is still holding his promises, giving us what we need, and making sure and taking care of us all the time. We trust in God. Jonah, in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah is, remember, remember he swallowed up by that great fish which God provided. He said, verse 7, he said, that I fainted within myself. I remembered the Lord. And I offered up my prayer into his holy temple. You did what, Jonah? He said, I remember God. Now, when you think about where Jonah was and the condition of, of what's going on, here you are. You've, you've been thrown overboard. Yes, you volunteered, but you've been thrown overboard. You really have no thought of making it. You have been swallowed up by this great fish, this great animal, if you will, that God has provided, not knowing the outcome, not knowing what's going to happen. And he says that when my soul fainted within me, I remembered God. That's kind of interesting, at least to me. I remembered God. It's almost as if Jonah was saying that through all of this, I had forsaken God, but I remembered him. And what did you do, Jonah? I prayed to him. I went from going, maybe running, well, we know the story, running away, but truly leaving him behind to remembering him and wanting to do what he said. Why? Because I needed his help. We need to remember that. David said in 2 Samuel 22 and verse 31, The way of the Lord is perfect. And he was able to say that because he says the Lord's our shield. Our shield. That's an interesting thought there. Shield was used by the soldier to protect. To protect from the enemies that were coming at them. To protect from the blows of the swords of the individual which they were fighting. Now, We don't know in this verse exactly which shield he was talking about. Was he talking about the the, the big shield that some were as tall as six feet that that covered the whole body? Was he talking more of a a half-body shield, or was he talking more of a shield like a trash can? Those were the three that were used in biblical times. We don't know. It's not important. It's the idea the shield is the defender. Shield is the one that throws the blows off. He says, the Lord's our shield. The Lord's going to help us. The Lord's going to be there for us. But what, what do we have to do? Well, we have to remember who God is, where he is, and put our faith and trust in him. And that's when when you get to a point of really being discouraged and disappointed and, and, and just hurt, that's really hard. Because all of a sudden, we have to leave ourselves from the standpoint of saying, it's not about me, and it's not about what I want. I've got to put my faith and trust in someone else. And so, much like the old cat, I know several of you that love cats, and Suzanne and I do as well. We've had a few in our married life. The old cat, that once he gets sick, what does he do? A lot of times they run off if they can. Why? Well, That's just what God almost seemingly has instilled within them. They run off and they run off to die. 
they run away from the very ones that could help them, the very ones that could at least love on them, at least for their last little bit. And when we get discouraged, we're much like that old cat. We run away. Jonah, running away. Jonah, of course, we know the story. He found what he needed to find. He, Jonah 3, he repented. And Jonah 4, he, he's running really ahead of God, but he's trying to help God out. In our discouragement, put your hope, put your trust in God. Secondly, Jonah, or excuse me, David in Psalm 42 reminds us to count our blessings. When we grow discouraged, we tend to look not at what we have, but what we want, what we don't have. You see, that's really what causes the discouragement. Oh, I want this. I was out. I had to run an errand yesterday. I went to the store, and as I was at the store, I looked at clothes. I don't buy a lot of clothes. I just buy them occasionally, but I enjoy clothes. And so I looked at something, and I thought, hmm, okay, I might buy that. No, I'll bring Suzanne back and ask her if it's the right thing. Now, that's how I usually buy my clothes. I, I look at them, figure out, and then I ask Suze, and she, she'll she tell me yay or nay. And so I looked at it, and then I looked at the price. Price was good, but then I thought, it's winter clothes. I need to go home and look in the closet. I looked in the closet. I don't need that. I don't need it. But I thought there for a while, yeah, that would be the thing. That would be the thing to have. But in reality, I don't need it. Well, what am I doing? Well, when we get discouraged, we're looking at what we want, not what we need, but what we want, and then we look at what we don't have. In order to help us overcome discouragement, we need to look not at what we don't have, but what we do have. What do, what do we have? What's going on? How has God blessed us? How has God opened up the windows of heaven? How has God given us what we need? You know, he's the one that the psalmist said in Psalm 118, he daily loads us with benefits. He daily gives us what we need. When Hezekiah, in Second Chronicles 32, when Hezekiah was doing his, for lack of a better term, his religious sort of revival, cleaning out everything, getting everything going, Azariah, the chief priest, made an interesting statement. And basically his statement was this, you know, since you opened up everything, since you you had this religious revival, he said, and you've told everybody what to do, he said, we have had enough. Talking about sacrifices. We've had enough given to sacrifice. We've had enough to eat. And we've had plenty left over. He began to count his blessings. Began to see, okay, this is... This is what we have. This is where we are. I, I think part of Paul's contentment in Philippians chapter 4, where he talked about, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And we've talked about that word learned there before. It's the idea of I have come to an understanding. I have sort of been schooled by life, if you will. And I have learned through a period of time, through the schooling of life, to be happy where I am with what I have. I think part of that is that he's able to see what he has, not what he doesn't have, not what somebody else has. He counts his blessings because he understands God blesses him. And so he's able to talk about those blessings and count those blessings. And when we begin to count our blessings, we have to understand we, be, we might begin because we are basically, this is just our nature, we may begin with our physical blessings. The clothes we have, the foods we eat, the, the transportation we have, the roofs over our heads, they may not be the greatest, they may not be the biggest, 
I mean, there's some big whopping houses in Nashville. And you don't have to go far from this church building to find some. And that's fine if those people have it and they, they want to live in that, okay. But what we have keeps us dry, keeps us warm in the winter, cool in the summer. We're blessed. We're blessed. Then when you look at the spiritual blessings and you think about the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, the hope that we have in this life of that which is yet to come. As we talked about this morning, the joy and the happiness that comes by being a child of God, those blessings that are ours. When we count those blessings, we learn and we soon realize our cup runs over. We have been blessed. And so truly we are individuals that do not need to be discouraged, but need to be revived in our thinking by the blessings that we have. And so that leads us to the third point. Psalm 42, David prayed to God. Prayer is important. We pray and we believe in prayer. But we treat prayer as just that which we do. Now, we can quote all the Bible that talks about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, that we're praying always with all prayer and supplication. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Uh, men ought to always pray and not faint. We can quote all those verses, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that at all to be reminded of those verses and those thoughts. But as we're reminded of those verses and those thoughts, we need to understand the power of which we are connecting into. You ever put your finger in an electric socket? Can I give you some advice? Don't do it. Don't do it. It can be a shocking experience if you make all the connections. Why do I know that? Don't ask. <laughs> But at the same time, too, there's prayer. Well, God already knows what I need. God already knows that I'm not real happy with life, and I'm not real happy with what's going on, and I'm not real happy with the church, and I'm not, to be honest, just real happy with him. God says, can you let me handle it? Can you let me take care of it? Can you let me be the one that, that assists you? Can you come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help? Or Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. In time of need? Why, sure. Okay. Well, then pray. When we are discouraged, we often want to end all of the relationships that we have. But if we pray to God, we understand that as the psalmist said in Psalm 61, verse 1, Hear my prayer, O God. How important that is. Because we know that he hears. I used to have a man in congregation where I work that he would end his prayers this way. Hear us, O God. When I first heard that, individual, when I first heard that man lead in prayer, I thought, it's almost redundant. God does hear us. He's promised that. We don't have to beg him to hear us. And then I, I understood as I got to know him a little bit better and I got to understand where he was coming from, it helped. It helped me to understand why he was pleading with that within his prayer and why I really while still thinking redundancy, but realizing that it was all right. Because when we cry out, as the psalmist so many times did, hear my cry, O God. Listen to what I'm saying. We're grabbing the ear. We're grabbing the attention of God when we pray. And we're praying to the very one that can fix Whatever the problem is, preacher, that's why I'm discouraged. 
I've spent a long time praying to him about something. And he hasn't heard my prayer yet. He hasn't given me the answer that I wanted. I prayed and he didn't give it to me. Where was he? You see, we've looked at that all wrong. We've looked at that all wrong. We've looked as, as if he is out there and he hasn't heard us and he's not answering us when we really need to stop and think about maybe he's where he needs to be answering our prayers the way we need them answered. Uh-oh. And thought about it that way. I haven't thought about the fact that maybe he's where he needs to be answering my prayers the way he thinks and he knows all that I needed answered. And so maybe, maybe I'm not asking with the right understanding of just saying, not my will, but yours be done. And so we're reminded, as the psalmist reminds us, pray to God and pray in those times of discouragement. If my people remember Second Chronicles 7 verse 14, well-known verse, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, what's the promise? I'll hear and I'll answer. And so, in the midst of discouragement, pray. But then fourthly, desire to go to the house of the Lord. Do what? Desire to go worship. Oftentimes, when we're discouraged, especially in spiritual matters, for whatever reason, we're like that old cat, and we want to absent ourselves from fellowship of the brethren that can help us the most. Instead of opening our arms to that fellowship. Well, the psalmist would say in Psalm 122 that I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. We need that same feeling. Why? Well, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 10, and you go back and you look at, at Hebrews chapter 10, and you look, first of all, in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. You say, all right, yes. We're going to stick to what's true. We're going to stick to what's right. We're going to stick with God. But then you, you look at the very next verse, and he says, let's consider one another. To do what? In order to stir up to love and to good works. Okay, we're going to hold fast the confession of our faith. The hold fast is the idea of grabbing hold of so as to not let go. I'm going to grab my faith. I'm going to hold on to it because I don't want to let it go. And then what does he say next? Well, go back. What does he say? He says, let us consider one another. Let's give thought to one another so that we might provoke, stir up, depending upon the version that you're using, one another, to love and to good works. Okay, I'm going to hold fast my confession, but I, I'm, I'm discouraged. Things aren't going the way that they should. My faith is being shaken by the things in my life that I don't like. But I've got a fellowship over here that's been charged by God to provoke, to push, to encourage me to love and to good works. Where do I go? Psalmist says, run to it. Don't run from it. Run to it. Run to that fellowship. Allow that fellowship to help. You might say, preacher, how, how do you know that? Because the very next verse, verse 25 of Hebrews 10, that's the one we all know not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. We've used that verse. We beat people over the head with that verse about not forsaking the assembly. I'm not saying that's wrong. But we should explain why we don't forsake the assembly because there's a fellowship of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that are there with the idea not of hurting you, not of alienating you, not of running you off, not of trying to tear you down, not of trying to, to pull you down in your life, but trying to build you up. To make you feel better about what's going on. To strengthen your faith. To strengthen your resolve.
push you to love and the good works, to help you to see the good and not the bad, the hope and not the failure, the promise and not what you left behind and are discouraged over. And so we're reminded, run to the fellowship of the Lord, run to the fellowship of his people, desire to go to the house of the Lord instead of running away from it. Seems strange, but you know what the Lord knew? He knew the importance of people. He always used people. You know what Paul would write in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13? That he would use people for his good work. Didn't he prove that by the coming of Titus in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6? God who comforts those that are cast down, comfort us with the coming of Titus. Didn't he use that? With a fellow by the name of Epaphroditus, didn't he use that? With a fellow by the name of Onesiphorus, didn't he use folks to encourage others that were going through difficult times? The answer is yes. We are that light then, and you have to remember that as well. We are that light that when you see brothers and sisters come into Christ, you don't know, or come in the building, you don't know what's going on in their life. You may think you know. I've had a lot of people think they know what's going on in other people's lives, and they've had no clue. You know, people will talk, sadly, but they'll talk, and they'll say, Preacher, hey, do you know so-and-so, but such, such and such is happening, and so-and-so, and maybe you do know as a preacher because you help, you're trying to help this person, and you can't tell that person that thinks they know it all, you are so wrong. But what you can do is go to that person and say, glad you're here, hope this is a Day of encouragement for you. And if I can do anything, let me know. David said, I was glad. When they said, let's go. Sort of like the, we really need to be like the little boy that <laughs> ran into services once and he just he just loved going to church. Jay's got a good story. Shared it with me at lunch today. Just ask Jay, I won't tell you because it's his kin folks and so I can't tattle on his kin folks. But uh, uh, this little boy was about four years old, and he wanted to go to church. He loved going to church. One day he was just a little bit late. He walked in. He threw open the doors, and he said, okay, let's get the party started. We need to have that attitude. Worship is yes about praising God. But what we gain out of worship will get us through the next week if we'll let it. And so, how do you go from being discouraged to being happy? Well, it does take a while. I mean, let's, let's admit it. We all get discouraged. And it does take a while to get over it. Sometimes we mumble and grumble and complain and fuss and, and kick and everything else. But we just have to work on it, work on us a little bit at the time. I know of a fellow that he has passed away now. He actually, several years after I was no longer where, uh, close to him, uh, he developed cancer and, and died. I, if I'm not mistaken, it was the cause of death, but, but he died. But every time you'd see him, you'd say, how you doing? He said, I'm getting better. And what I come to find out or what I came to find out was he was constantly working on himself to improve. May we constantly work on ourselves to improve. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come and study your word, to be reminded of some of the great blessings that are found in your word that helps us through some of the, the difficult times in our lives. We ask that you be with us, that we may be better Christians and better friends and, and better fellow Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ, that we may help those that truly need help as they help us. Help us to always lean upon you, to look 
towards you and never run away from you. Dear Lord, help us to be individuals that truly are the light that shines in the community, that sees not us, but sees you. Watch over us, bless us, and keep us. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This evening, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come? All together we stand and sing.